Uh, Mike, thanks for being here with us tonight. Uh, it's, it's, it's a pleasure, and uh, anything that really has to do with aliens, which I mentioned earlier, is, uh, I think, the best movie that I've ever done. I'll always come out for because I just love it so much. I have such great memories about working on it. Um, it was it was a great time in a lot of our lives. I think the actors and the crew and and uh, Jim and Gail and everybody. It's definitely my favorite that you've done. Like I, I swear, I wore out two of the VHSs growing up watching that thing over and over again. So um, just to talk a little bit about like dropping into that role though, like. So you got, it was from Gail Ann Hurd that called you at the last minute when James Raymar dropped out and uh, you had to jump in there. So had you read the script or anything at that point? Um, I don't know. I, well, you know, I might, I might have uh, earlier, you know, uh, months earlier when, when they were casting it. I don't ever remember reading the script. I, you know, I'd done The Terminator with Jim and I had a, a good agent at the time who knew us both and Jim uh, was clear that he wanted to use James for the role of Hicks, and and that was the role that that, that uh, I would have been right for, I think. And um, at the time, I didn't know I was going to be doing a, that movie and another movie with Jim, and we would have this connection. And it was just, yeah, okay, well, I understand, you, want, you know. So um, I did, I, you know, they cast it. And they went off to make the movie, and. You know, I was, I was, somebody asked me today, might have been one of you people, asked me today, were you intimidated when you did The Terminator? You know, like working with James Cameron. And I was like, no, because he wasn't James Cameron, you know. <laughs> he was Jim, you know, and um, um, hadn't done anything. He'd, he'd done um, Piranha 3 and uh, the Roger Corman movie and been fired off of it. And uh, so... Uh, out of nowhere, Gail, who I knew very well from working with her on The Terminator, and um, called me and, and asked me uh, if I would come over. And I think it was late in the week, Wednesday or Thursday, and if I, if I could come over and play Hicks. And, um, you know, I immediately said yes. Um, probably read the script, probably got the script delivered to me and read it on the way over. Uh, the role, uh, as wonderful of a role as it is, uh, is not one with a tremendous amount of dialogue. I mean, when you compare that to uh, uh, the character that I played in The Terminator, who has all the exposition and basically has to tell everybody the story, who the Terminator is, and who I am, and who she is, and what's going to happen in the future, and what, you know, like... Hicks is, you know, he's a smile, he's a, you know... Uh, and Jim Cameron, my experience with working with Jim and Gail were that when Jim would write a scene, Jim very rarely, I, I don't remember him writing what, what, what would be more than a three-page scene, and it was... I never remember big chunks of dialogue in any of Jim's scripts for any characters, like big, you know, chunks, so like you, you do when you're doing a television show or something. And uh, so it was, it was easy for me to come in. I didn't have to go through that whole boot camp, like learning how to march thing. And um, I came in, and um, I was immediately surrounded by people I think that felt that they um, knew me and what were maybe somewhat relieved um, that that I was there. They knew that they could count on me. I knew Bill Paxton very well. Um, I think Bill was happy. I think uh, I think I know Bill was happy. And um, you know, I'd worked. I just got done working with Jim and Gail. And uh, so, it, and the person that I didn't know, of course, was Sigourney. And, um, you know, I hate, not a hate, but I, you know, I don't like the sound like, oh my God, everybody, everything's so wonderful. I, you know, I'll tell you stories about you know, a lot of things in my life that aren't, but Sigourney Weaver really is really kind of the best of the best. She not only is a wonderful actress, a great actress, but she is a, um, 
uh, she, you know, she, she works hard. And so does Jim, so does Gail, so does anybody who's doing a movie like that. The, you know, everybody works hard. The, 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 the standards are set high, you know? And Sigourney was like, the, she was the, the head of the snake on that movie, without a doubt, among the cast. And she was ready to go to work all the time. You never, you know, you, you were never waiting on Sigourney. So you, you felt pretty welcome coming onto that Absolutely. set, then dropping in at yeah. the last minute. Yeah. Okay. Now, when you, talking about the Terminator and the alien, or aliens, you know, um, I see a lot of similarities between the two. I like to think the, the roles you played in those, I'm going to call them the quiet, unassuming badass. Like, you show up, you get shit done. There's not a lot of, you know, like, you're very efficient in those roles. Playing the, Those characters are very efficient at what they do. You know, Kyle protecting Sarah. Hicks getting what needs to be. You nuke it from orbit, you know. He, he's very pragmatic. Whereas, And I think that defines a lot of both of those characters at a time where, you know, action heroes were supposed to be these big... Stallone, Schwarzeneggers, you know, you're, you're standing out as these guys who let their actions do the talking, you know. How, how did you, you know, approach those roles with that kind of, you know, substance to them? Well, I approach the roles differently, but the most important thing for an actor and any actor, any actor will tell you that the most important thing for them is are the words that are on the page. And, you know, that, those words, you know, I, I, didn't, I didn't have to adopt much with Hicks. I didn't have to, you know, I didn't have to like, oh, well, you know, what was his background? You know, like, I didn't have to do that much. I just came in and just said the lines that were there. Yeah, did I have to look tough? Did I have to look butch? Did I have to look like a man? Yes, but, um, and I, I do think that, um, uh, that I had a different take on it than James did. I think James was a little bit, I think, I could be wrong, but I think that James Remar might have been a little bit gruffer with the character, a little bit gruffer with Newt, a little bit gruffer. I think I remember uh, Gail and Jim talking to me very early on. I think one of, the, one of the early scenes that we shot, and they'd been around James for rehearsals in the first couple of weeks and, and stuff, and I... I think one of the first things that we shot was me, me re reaching, trying to, you know, find Newt or reach for Newt, and that's when she bites me. And I think that I, I smile. It's almost like, oh, wow, you know, that's, and I, yeah, and I, I, I think they noticed right away that, that I was bringing something lighter to the character. And there's, there's, and, and I did make some choices, and um, a choice that I made that might have not been played the same way by another actor that really stands out in that movie is because I don't really have that much that I'm doing, but it makes a big difference when you don't have much that what you do do, people get an, an idea, and that's when, they, when, uh, when they're arguing about whether they should nuke it from space or not, whatever, and she says, I, I think Hicks, Hicks is in charge here, not you, not me, Hicks is in charge. And instead of saying, yeah, yeah, I'm in charge. So, you know, like, it, it, you know, I just made the choice of, <laughs> heck, <laughs> yeah, I guess I am. Shit. This falls, yeah, this, this, this falls on me. And, you know, so little, little small choices like that, little, little things that, that, that I did with the character. There was a scene where um, we were all looking at the map you just watched it, you remember, we're all looking at the map and Newt is running around down below. And that's the way that it was written. And I said to Jim, Jim, let, do you mind if I just pick up Newt and let her see what's going on? And I think Jim immediately, well, yes, of course. And actors who have the confidence in their own abilities, if somebody has an idea that's different than what they have, um, if they have confidence in their own abilities, they'll hear something maybe that they hadn't thought of or, and, and think, well, yes. And they're, 
the flirtation, which I always call the like story between Sigourney's character and my, my character in the movie, was always there. You know, it was on paper. It was, it was there. And then it just came down to kind of flirting a little bit in a scene or two. And I respected her. She respected me. Um, you know, you want that in any relationship. When a woman looks at you for, you know, you're the man in this relationship, or you're the woman, or you're, you know, in this relationship. So, some roles, the better that it's written, the easier it is to play. And, you know, I went on to, with Jim and Gail to do The Abyss, and that character was one who had to be, like, all pumped up and went through some changes of like getting sick and then like realizing what the text and not knowing what the audience knew that there were aliens out there. But you know, if I told you there was an alien on the other side of the screen, you'd be like, dude, you know. And 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 that that took much more effort. You know, that was much more effort. But Hicks was just easy to play because it was written so, so, so well. Jim, Jim did the heavy lifting for you when he wrote it. I think Jim always does the heavy lifting when it comes to, well, when it comes to, and you just watch this, and we made that, it was actually made in 1985, came out in 86, 1985, and so that's 35 years and you, and I, again, I haven't seen it on the big screen for a while, but if you look at the, um, you know, when I, when I look at it and I, I see it on my phone or on my computer, and the visual effects still hold up. 35 years of, of CGI and special effects and innovation in that field that goes, you know, through Robert Rodriguez and Mandalorian, I mean, all that kind of stuff. We're used to that now. We're used to seeing all that stuff. But back then, you know, I mean, I could name other directors that are big stars. You look, go back and look at some of their earlier moves and, or movies and you look at some of their early Earth CGI's and some of their franchises. And so. Doesn't quite have the believability that I think that this, I mean, even the Terminator. I wish, I've never asked him this, um, but there are times that I've wanted to go back and, and say to Jim, um, you know what, Jim, we should take the Terminator. We should go back and take that one stop motion pick shot of, 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 of the Terminator 8 out. Maybe that thing where, where Arnold's like fixing his eye and it's obviously, you know, what it is. And, you know, I just kind of bring it up to snuff here. And uh, I would never suggest that just because I know Jim, first of all, doesn't even have time to listen to a suggestion like that, let alone contemplate it, but um, um, the, you know, something special about aliens, there was something special about the relationship that we all had, um, there was something special about the sets, and there's also something special about working on a film set when the Terminator had come out, and people that knew films, knew about film, knew this guy, this guy Jim Cameron, he's you know, so we had this director, this great up-and-coming director. We had this great sets out of Pinewood Studios in England. And this cast of people that, like, Sigourney I learned to love, but I love them all. I mean, deeply. I mean, deeply. And um, never any friction, never any... I never heard anybody say a bad word about anybody on that, on that show. And... Uh, um, so. so when you got dropped in there, they had already done the personalization on their armor, and I know you did not love that heart on the front of your armor that uh, James Raymar had put on there, on the front of Hicks's armor. If yes. you had had your opportunity back then, what do you think you would have put on there for Hicks? Well, it's hard for me to go back and put myself um, in, in that place. Um, I just had twins. I might have done something um, who are now 37 or 38. Um, they were, uh, well, I hadn't just had them, but they were young and they were a big part of my life, obviously. I, might, I, I don't know. I just know, um, and 
you know, what James did do was, you know, create the heart with the lock, and there's something very wonderful about that. Um, I just thought it looked like a bullseye when I f first saw it. And, Put a target on it. Yeah, you. it was red and it pink, and it was like right there, and I just said, and um, I did ask Jim if, I, if, he would, if he would consider, you know, like changing that out, but they had already shot a little bit with James, and I think that uh, James Remar, and I think that James Cameron felt, well, oh, there might be a shot where we see something, and I don't want it not to match, and uh, um, so, it, you know, look, my, there, you know, like, I, I've been on movies where there are problems, you know, <laughs> big problems, and usually they have to do with a script and a director that doesn't want to listen or a studio or a group that doesn't want to listen to you or other actors or DPs or a director that is, you know, and that, you know, what you're talking about there is like, okay, yeah. right, move, you know, <laughs> moving on. You, you seem to have, like, a pretty decent relationship with Jim Cameron, and, um, you know, you, you listen to a lot of actors talk and the, the, the opinions range from one side to another and everything. You know, looking back at, like, everything that he's done and everything, you know, thinking about how he started in The Terminator and where you were and then where he would end up being, like, how do you look back upon that and your working relationship? Because you were part of that. Like, I don't think The Terminator would have been what it is without your performance. So looking back at that, like, how do you feel about you know him getting started back there with you? Well, we were young, <laughs> and I think Jim was thirty and I was twenty-eight when we did the Terminator. And uh, uh, Jim was confident and he knew what he wanted. And uh, people around him, um, Jim's uh, presence on a set has never changed through the making of Aliens and through the making of The Abyss. And um, maybe once he went off to do other movies, uh, True Lies, or, I can't speak to uh, T2 or, uh, you know, Avatar, but Jim always set the bar very high. And he demand, he didn't demand, demands almost too harsh of a word to use, but he, when, when you're competitive, like, like I am, like I think most actors and most people in the business, whether they're in props, whether in the lighting, whether they're in makeup, whether um, they're in casting, they're, you're competitive. You want, you want to do the best job can, you can. And when you have somebody that demands, and again, that word is a little bit, you know, I could, could, if you don't, <laughs> except for the acting, if you don't do it, Jim will be able to do it himself. You know, whether it's lighting, whether it's special effects, whether it's um, props, whether it's makeup. Um, I, I never have had, um, you know, I, I work with Billy Freakin. Billy Freakin, I work with Billy twice and I love Billy. But not everybody does. Right. And Billy Free can, um, can be, I would, I, would, I would call him scary, <laughs> you know. And, um, and he didn't scare me. I was sort of in my, my prime, and, and um, we had one or two. You know, the same thing happens a lot of times in life, and uh, I think it happened, uh, one, it happened with Billy with me for sure, uh, but I would never have had a chance to work with Billy if it hadn't been for Jim Cameron. But uh, I, I've told this story before, you probably find it on YouTube, but I'll repeat it, and that is um, um, there was a, a time and a place, and I don't remember exactly what it was, but it was at the beginning of, of, the, of the shooting of, of The Terminator. And I did a take, and uh, after the camera stopped rolling, Jim said, Michael, that's exactly what I don't want. <laughs> and I said, okay, Jim, um, everybody on the set knows that you can do their job better than them, but you can't play Kyle Reese, so give me an effing line reading, and let's move on. And he did, and I did, and we did. And 
You know, any time, again, I, you know, I, I like to be challenged as an actor. You know, some of the uh, pictures that I signed today were, um, were Tombstone. I wasn't, I wasn't challenged by any director on that movie, that's for sure. Um, but I was challenged by Val Kilmer and Val Kilmer's performance. I thought, oh my, that guy, <laughs> that guy is gonna run away with this movie unless I step up here. So that was a challenge to me. And you know, I grew up, like, like most people, I had some, I'm not an athlete, but uh, you know, I played sport. I, I like to be challenged, it brings the best out of me, and I think it brings the best out, out of a lot of people. And um, Jim has, has always been that way. And um, if I had, if I had a telephone right here, and I needed to get to Jim Cameron, I could pick up that telephone wherever he is right now, and if I made it known to him that I had an emergency that I needed to talk to him about, and I needed to talk to him about it as soon as possible, he'd pick up the phone. And I've never had to do that, but it's nice to know that you have a friend, any friend, who you know is going to, and especially Jim Cameron. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good friend to have, yeah, yeah. definitely. And, you know, I, 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 it, I felt very sentimental about working, um, uh, kind of uh, reliving some of this stuff recently. I don't, I don't usually. Um, I guess maybe the older I get, the more I realize what a wonderful time it was and what, how we were all just in our, the zenith of our careers, Bill and Sigourney and Jim and Gail and, and everybody, the, the music and the, 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 you know, it was, you know, when you're young, you don't think about, you don't, you don't think about that. Um, so I, I, found, I found myself unusually uh, moved since I've been here and since I've been talking to people about um, the experience that I had, where five or 10 years ago, ah, this story, that story, this story, that story, but there's something, I guess, that just getting older makes me. You really loved what you, what you do. I love what I do, but I don't, <laughs> I don't love a lot of movies that I worked on. Navy Seals is a movie that like, I hated working on that movie, hated it, hated it, hated the, Well, I, it, was, it was a movie that had a lot of potential, mm -hmm. and it um, had an incredible cast, and uh, it had an Academy Award winning director of photography. We had the Navy involved, we had the SEALs involved. It could have been Top Gun, and it wasn't, but it could have been. Yeah. It could have been, for sure, it could have been. But it was almost, I, I was fighting against like the, like, like this four, like the Terminator, you know, just kept coming at me. I'm like, whoa, you know. Um, so, <clears throat> and you know, the only, the uh, Tombstone was an incredibly troubled production. Director, really? yeah, director was uh, Kevin Jar, wrote the script. Mm -hmm. And um, we shot for four, it was a 136 page script and, um, which is two hours and um, 15 minutes from the length of this one that you just saw. And they shot with Kevin direct, directing the movie. He had written that, he'd written Glory before that. Um, uh, the Ed Swick, is that his name? Ed Swick's movie. Um, and they waited four weeks and then they, 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 they let him go. And then they brought in a new director, um, a guy that I, I personally didn't, didn't get along with very well. And it was just problems all over the place. And so they ended up cutting that movie down to probably 95 minutes. And um, big swaths of that movie are gone. All the women's roles, all the, the, the love stories missed, gone. And now that's just them riding off on a horse. Um, and, you know, working with Freakin, you know. 
Um, things are, are not always, not, not only aren't they always, they're very rarely um, a place like we had when we were making Aliens, a place that everybody felt safe, everybody felt excited, everybody thought, ah, this has got a chance, this cast, all getting along and we're all pulling together here and we're doing this and we all agree and that's the, that's the guy that we follow and you know, and they're just very, very few um, are like that. Sometimes you start off thinking, oh, this is going to be like that, and it, it, it just isn't, and it doesn't turn out to be that way, and there are problems along the way. So, Yeah, there's definitely, you, you can feel the energy in Aliens, where your guys' performance, yours, Jeanette's, and um, somebody else I wanted to talk about, too, was you know an actor that every time he got cast, I just get a smile seeing his name, is Bill Paxton. And uh, you worked with him several times. Like, you guys were on Terminator together. I don't know how much you guys actually worked together on that, because he was barely in the movie. But, you know, you guys would go on and do Tombstone and Aliens and stuff. And I wondered if you had any stories about Bill. <laughs> I've got a lot of stories about Bill. I've got a lot of stories about Bill. And somebody asked me earlier about him. Um, I met Bill on a movie called Lords of Discipline which is uh, based on a Pat Conroy novel that was directed by Frank Rodham. Um, and David Keith starred in it. I played the bad guy in it, and uh, it's uh, based on a story about the first black cadet at the Citadel, the military school. And uh, I played this racist, well, they were all, everybody was racist back then there in the South in that time, and there was no black, you know, it, it, in the, in, at the Citadel, and Bill came on, and he was like my second in command bad guy, and that's where I met Bill, and uh, we got along famously. Bill is, I have another friend named Timmy Colseri who played the door gunner in Full Metal Jacket, who brings that kind of energy into a room, but very, very few people do. Very, very few, few people bring the kind of energy that Bill Paxton brought into a room. And anybody that's ever known him or worked with him knows that. Some people might be like, oh, dude, okay, all right, whoa, man, you know. But I'd rather have more. I'd rather have more than less. As a director, I would rather have an actor who brought me too much. I'm like, okay, bring it down a little bit. We'll shave this off, they shave that off, than not have anything at all, not be able to get anything from them in the first place. And Bill would walk onto a set. You knew he was there, or he'd walk into, you know. And we used, we were good friends, good friends when um, um, when we were doing Lords of Discipline. And um, you know, he met his uh, his his wife of thirty or or forty whatever years uh, there while we were doing Lords of Discipline. And um, he introduced me to Jim Cameron before Jim uh, uh, cast me in The Terminator. They worked, at, they, they worked together at Roger Corman's company painting sets or that type of miniature making, or, but they both, they met there and I was at some sort of screening and, and, and he, he introduced me to him. Oh, hi Jim, nice to meet you. And when I, you know, like that was, you know, and then Jim had me come in for The Terminator and auditioned for that role, which I did, and uh, I got that. Um, but Bill started off being a personality, a bigger than life personality that sometimes you feel like you wanna bring that down. But what he did here in Aliens, I mean, that was, that was that's, that's kind of the Bill that, that, that I fell in love with as a young man, and we used to hang a lot, you know, and, and, and spend a lot of time together. So, yeah, he, I wasn't on the set the day that he worked in The Terminator, um, but, um, again, we had the best time when we were doing Aliens, just the absolute best times. We were living in London in a area called Chelsea, which is kind of a cross between Beverly Hills and Melrose. If you know Los Angeles at all, it's like 
rich, but it's kind of hip and cool. You, and um, we both had great flats, and we both had the dollar was really strong. And uh, to say that we sat at home and, 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 and worked on our lines much would be a, uh, <laughs> a damn right lie, you know. Um, like I said, Hicks didn't have much to say. If I only had one or two words to say the next day, I don't, you know. Um, but uh, Bill was, um, the interesting thing about Bill was, Bill's, and we have a, there was a man named Vincent Chase who taught me about acting, and, and he was the godfather of three of my children. And I introduced Bill to him, and he used to work a lot with Bill. And Bill's, what I would call acting chops, got better and better and better and better, um, to the point where, uh, you know, when I first met him, he was just this, personality. And you can go a long ways on just having a big personality. But Vince and he worked on, on bringing that stuff down. The one he did, I forget the name of the movie, the one he did with Billy Bob Thornton. Anybody know that movie? Um, but what is it? Simple plan. Yeah, Simple Plan, exactly. Just awesome in that movie. And, and like down here, not, hey, what's going on, you know? Just awesome, and two of them, Billy Bob, great actor also. Um, and, and he was very creative, and he, he also was a director, you know, and he directed uh, 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 One False Move, his, I think is his, his first movie that he directed, which just like really made people go like, I, you know, like, wow, this guy's a talented person. He really talented. One False Move was like, well cast, well made, well, you know, great little, great little movie. And so I watched him kind of blossom. You know, I mean, he was always, blo I mean, he was always, the, you know, he'd already, he'd already blossomed, but from a talent standpoint, I watched him, it's almost like, more, more like a diamond that just gets, gets sharper and sharper, more, be and more beautiful, the more that it's been, 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 and I watched that happen with him. And, um, uh, he had a, a great career, and a, 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 eh, you know, we all have a, a, a date with our number on it, but his death was a very, um, it was a stupid mistake by, yeah, and um, it, not him, although um, not him, um, and, but, you know, uh, what they, they used to, you know, they compare him to Marilyn Monroe, but, but he's like a, like, like a, what do they, they talk about, like a star that's like really bright and then it's gone, sort of? Yeah. That's more of kind of like, you know, maybe things worked out the way that they were supposed to because, you know, I, you know. Always leave them wanting more. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, um, he was he was he, he was very special, and I loved him, and and um, um, I love his family, and um, 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 he was he was a good man. Yeah, on top of being a good actor, he was, he was a good man, you know. You, and good you husband. Were, good you man. worked with a lot of people, like. And, and let's go back to Tombstone for a second. That that cast, like you, you already talked about how you know it was in trouble and stuff, but that cast was just amazing. You know, this cast is incredible, too, but if I don't ask a couple Tombstone questions, I'm going to get killed here. I understand. Right, I'm talking to Johnny Ringo. So, I understand. Yeah. So, like, you know, you, you already talked about being intimidated by Val. So, you know, oh, you want... Intimidated wouldn't... I would never have used... You know, I wouldn't say intimidated. I just would say, you know, I would... Like when you play on a football team or you play on a... Bat, you see the other guys warming up. You know, I'm, I'm, you had to bring it. <laughs> yeah, I wouldn't, I wouldn't, I didn't, I don't ever like go into anything thinking, oh, I'm going to get my ass handed to me here, you know, but um, I wouldn't say intimidated, but anyway, I, I interrupted. No, 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 I mean, that's, it, it, it kind of goes into the whole, you know, um, somebody reminded me earlier today of the scene where you guys are having your little showdown in the yeah. saloon. Yeah. And you're being all fancy with your gun. Yeah. 
and then he's fancy with his cup. gun. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. You know, you know, swinging his cup around and everything and stuff like that. You know, to, how like did that yeah. actually? You guys actually just play off each other like that the entire time? Or well, again, it goes to the, the best two scripts. I, and you know. I, uh, and maybe not the best two or whatever, but it, that was a great script, a great script. And that's why you had um, Sam Elliott in it, and that's why you had Bill Paxton in it, and that's why you had John Corbin in it, and that's why you had Billy Bob Thornton in it, and that's why you had Val and myself. It was like, we just gravitated. I mean, it's a, you know, actors know, right? Uh, I had an agent named Ed Lamato time when they were casting that and uh, Kurt was set to play Wyatt Earp and they, they sent my, me the script <clears throat> and my agent Ed Lomano said read the script, they want to know if you'd be interested in playing any, any character in it so I read it and I was like yeah, uh, I want to play Doc Holliday <laughs> <laughs> because um, actors they just, you see it, it's on the paper and it's like, a, you know, you see it and you know it. And, you know, a day or two went by, and ah, it looks like that might be going to Val Kilmer. And um, so, um, <clears throat> so is there any, any other character that you want to play? Johnny Ringo. I knew immediately I didn't want to play one of Wyatt's brothers. I didn't want to play, you know, uh, Johnny Bean. I, I knew, I knew that that was, that was uh, uh, a role. Somebody asked me recently, uh, when you get to be my age recently, it was like maybe five years ago, <laughs> oh, a while ago. I don't know when it was, but it was, it was a while ago. But, but it feels recently. Somebody asked me, wouldn't it be interesting if, if I had played Doc Holliday and he played Johnny Ringo? Because I knew that. I knew, I knew Doc Holliday. I knew that role was like, man, that's, that's gold right there. You know, that's, I want that, you know. Uh, so, what was interesting about that movie is I've talked about my relationship to you about Bill and how close we were. And, and we did five movies together, by the way. And, um, and the only really bad one was Lord's, I mean, um, Navy Seals. Um, <laughs> horrible, horrible. Um, um, uh, I've gotten really old. I've lost my train of thought here. Where, where was I? What, what was I talking about? You know, you were talking about working with Bill and. Um... Oh, oh! I think that that on on Tombstone, the thing that was sort of interesting about that was that there were the good guys, and there were the bad guys. As far as I was concerned. We were the good guys, and they were the bad guys. If you really look at history and what really happened in that gunfight, when I called murder, um, there weren't any good guys and bad guys. There were innocent victims like the McClary brothers, but um, Wyatt Earp was no hero. Just, just, but, and, you, you, you kind of laugh like this is a holdover from, and it is to a certain extent, but if you read history, and if you really want to know about history, Wyatt Earp was a pimp. He was a thief. He was a horse thief. He was a pimp. He was a degenerate gambler and that's, married a bunch of whores. Not that I have anything against the working girls, okay? <laughs> but he was a pimp all of his life. I got nothing against the working girls, but I don't like pimps so much. And that's who Wyatt Earp was. And I, in case anybody here, I, I popped your bubble or whatever, I'm sorry. Uh, but it, it's, it's kind of a holdover from when, when we were doing that movie. I didn't, hang, I, didn't, I didn't hang out with Bill at all. We went out to dinner, I think, once. Um, I was hanging out with Powers Booth. Great, great actor. I was hanging out with Stephen Lang. Brilliant, the brilliant, brilliant Stephen Lang. Um, I was uh, hanging out with John Corbett. I was hanging out with um, Thomas Hayden Church. 
you know, we were the cowboys, and they were the, they were, they were the herps. And so um, it was interesting because, because of the situation with the director, that, that's a movie that I can tell you, I didn't take any, there was, there's not a moment in that movie where anybody said to me, um, oh, hey, Michael, you want to try it? Maybe you know, a little heavier, a little less, a little bit more, whatever. That's my pro The interesting thing is because I've been signing autographs for so many years, um, I know, I know now that even though I played Kyle Reese and even though I, um, I played um, Hicks, Dwayne Hicks, um, well, if they mention me when I die, they'll say, that's the guy who played Johnny Ringo. That, that character has become more iconic, which is a word which I didn't even know what it meant 10 years ago, but like I'm learning more and more. That, that character is more iconic. That movie is more loved by more people than, than the, any of the three Cameron movies that I've done. That movie, you can take a 15-year-old girl, her 50-year-old parents, and her 75-year-old grandparents. They can all sit down and watch that movie and all enjoy that movie together. That movie has a way of, and I can't tell you how many people um, talk about the bonding they had with their parents and their grandparents because of that movie. And um, also, uh, guys in the military, uh, anybody who was overseas, anybody who was like doing um, Iraq or, you know, uh, they all, it's kind of an alpha movie anyway. Everybody loves that movie. Everybody knows that. I'll be your Huckleberry, you know. Yeah. See, I, st I mean, all these movies and people, I'll, you know, be place it's like hey my hey they they reckon hey I'll be your Huckleberry I'm like yeah it wasn't fucking my line but you know <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I like to joke about the fact that uh, I'm the one who had all the dialogue in the Terminator I'm the one who's like yeah this that and you're from the, I'm from the future and you're from the blah 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 but what's the one line that came out of that movie back then I'll be back <laughs> <laughs> so one that everybody remembers so. And you got to give it up also to Arnold, who was, at that time, you know, nobody, nobody, nobody was giving that guy any chance at all being an actor or, or a successful actor in Hollywood. He'd done like one of the Conans, Con the Conan, uh, Conan with the Barbarian movies. Nobody was giving, including me, giving that guy a chance. He never even could speak the English language properly. And... The, the fact that he became a movie star, well, for, he was Mr. Universe, so you don't become Mr. Universe by not working hard, not trying hard, not having a drive, but the fact that he became a movie star, and um, not just a movie, uh, the biggest movie star of his generation, him and Stallone, I think, probably, as far as money and $20 million a movie, and then like, yeah, well, you know what? I'll run for governor. <laughs> this guy that, you know, I, you know, I was, when I was doing the Terminator, so, you know, I mean, Arnold's career is just shock, shocking that, you know, like, where, where, where he went. I mean, it's just, it's just shocking how successful any person can, can become if they believe in themselves and, he and Jim have also got a very, the, uh, uh, I didn't know this until, again, recently, somewhere along the last five or 10 years of my life, but um, I, I saw it on YouTube where I see everything else. I so educate myself these days on YouTube. Um, uh, Arnold brought Jim the idea of doing True Lies. He saw a French film, I don't know if it was called True Lies or not, but he said, hey, Jim, here's his character, and he's, you know, and he's with the wife, and at home he's just, you know, dad or, or the husband or whatever, and he goes off and he does this thing. So if I'm not mistaken, True Lies was, was Arnold's, you know, deal. Hey, Jim, what do you think about that, you know? I've never even had the confidence. I've never 
had a piece of material or an idea that I've ever taken and gone, hey, Jim, <laughs> what about this? You know, because he's, an, he's a fascinating guy. There's a, I was on the Fox lot right after we did, um, right after he did Titanic, won all the Academy Awards, a bunch of Academy Awards for Titanic. I mean, he was like uh, uh, best director, best film, all that kind of stuff. Leonardo, all those things. And I was on the Fox lot, and somebody knew I was on the lot, and Jim found out I was on the lot. The messenger came by and said, hey, Jim wants you to come by and say hello. And so I said, okay. And so I went over to his office. I swear to God, this is a true story. I swear to God. So I'm sitting there, and I'm talking to him a little bit, and I'm like, okay, Jim, well, you just won an Academy Award for Best Picture, you know, Titanic, you know. Now what are you going to do? You know, like, right? And I swear to God, this is true. May God strike me. You know, he, he opened his, the drawer of, of the desk that he was sitting at at that moment when I asked him that question, and he pulled out two scripts. One was called Alita, Battle Angel. And the other one was called Avatar. Okay, this is six months, probably three months after he won the Academy Award. He had both of those scripts, and they were both written, and they were done, and they were right there. And I didn't know anything at the time. I was like, wow, okay, well, Alita, you know, Avatar, okay. Which one are you going to do? And he said, Michael, I don't know. I'm waiting for the technology to catch up to my vision of what these movies should look like. Now, I don't know how long it was between those films, but it was probably 10 years or something. Maybe somebody who's smarter than me would know the answer to that. Alita happened in 2019. 2019, and when did um, Titanic win the Academy? So how many years is that? Look, I, didn't, I, I didn't pay attention in school. <laughs> Almost 15 years. Yeah. 15 years. And he didn't do any movies in between, did he? Okay, but, he, but it, after Titanic, then he did Avatar, right? 15 years later? Is that correct? No, Avatar was 2009, and then Alita was 2019. Okay, 2009, but he didn't do anything in between my conversation with him and, and, and Avatar, correct? I don't think so either. So he waited 15 years to make that movie. It's incredible. He waited 15 years, and so... Now we're waiting 15 years for the sequel. <laughs> Don't count them out. You know, I mean, not that anybody would, um, but, you know, uh, a year from this Christmas is when the next Avatar comes out. And um, if they're still showing movies at theaters <laughs> in a year and a half, that's something that uh, I've been in the business so long that I think that we're getting to, and people don't like to hear this, but... Um, Streaming is becoming so popular now, and you can get a movie experience at home so much easier and so much more convenient that, you know, I predicted a long time ago that uh, Tom Cruise, Tom Hanks, um, Leonardo, Denzel, you know, these guys, last movie stars. Who pops, like, who pops? I mean, Lady Gaga, like, there are a few, that, but, like, who are the male movie stars now? And I, it's just because everything, there's so much content. You know, when I was young, there was ABC, NBC, CBS. Yeah. Eventually, there was Fox. There were eight studios, and there was Roger Corman's company, and there was nothing else. Now there's fucking 9,000 um, platforms and, and, and different places to watch stuff, and like six ESPN channels and four golf channels, and you know, you want you know, reality, to, man, there was a time when I, they, they, you, none of you are probably are too young, but there was a time when nobody had ever heard of the expression reality TV, <laughs> you know? And um, so it's, it's really been a, a pretty wonderful um, journey. Um, I kind of, you asked the question, I tried to answer it, and I ended up over here someplace. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Um, if it's okay, we're going to take a couple questions from the audience now. Okay. Okay. You have a question, sir? Yeah. So, so I heard there was a little controversy with tea time 
on the English set with the American crew and all that. And one specific experience. Can you do me a favor and either take your mask off or just scream in that? Yeah, no problem. I, I heard there was an interesting event surrounding tea time on the set for Aliens because of the British crew and something when they were filming the final scene with the loader and the I know, I know what you're talking about. Yeah. Things get so blown out of proportion, I'm telling you. They, yeah, we worked at Pinewood Studios, and I think, and Gail could tell you more about this than, than anybody else, but I think there's sort of a provision that it, if you work at Pinewood Studios, you use a certain amount of people that work at Pinewood or work in certain departments at, at, at Pinewood Studios. And um, so we had some people that were working at Pinewood that were all, also working on Aliens, but you don't want to get in Jim Cameron's way, you know, because, you know, one of his expressions is, that's exactly what I don't want, Mike, like I said. Um, but there, there was a shot that he set up that was uh, a big shot, you know, it was a four or five hour setup. And when you're that exacting, you know, everything has to be perfect. And um, uh, they used to blow smoke, I'm sure they probably still do, to create atmosphere, you know, and there'd be a person like waving to make the smoke like solid all the way across the screen. It's the worst job on a Jim Cameron movie you ever want, like, is the guy who's got to make the smoke. So you, you set up to shoot the shot, and you're four hours in or five hours in, and to redo that, you know, like after, to, 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 to do it again, it's gonna take another hour to get all the elements in place at the right time at the right place. And Jim had a big shot and then he had it all set up and he's ready to go. And about, he called action and the English crew came in with their tea. They had took tea breaks. That was just part of the, uh, if you're from England or if you know anything about anybody who lives in England, uh, you know they get wet all the time because it's always raining and they love their tea. And tea breaks were a big deal. And somebody opened a door and said, yeah, you know, thinking he was, you know, like, you know, everybody's going to be happy. We had tea, we got tea here and all the smoke. You know, and Jim, you know, I think lost his temper. <laughs> but here's, here's the interesting thing that I'm thinking about lately. About, and, and believe me, Jim, no, nobody that I've ever worked with is anything like this. Why are college and professional football coaches allowed to scream and yell and cuss at their players and at everybody on the team or in the other team and at the refs and, and go off because it's important to them and they're passionate about it and they care and their jobs are on the line and they want to win. So did Jim, you know, <laughs> so did I. But how come they can get away with that? But the rest of us, you know, like in the film industry, why can't, you know, Jim's to make, you know, 20, 50, 120 million dollar movies. It's a lot of pressure there. He should be able to raise his voice every once in a while, you know? Um, so that story is true, but, you know, was he upset? Yes, but, you know, small things like that, also in the abyss, I don't remember, you know, I think that uh, Ed Harris is a great actor and a wonderful man from everything that I could ever see, man's man, she used to smoke the marble, she used to smoke the, 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 the camel non-filters, I was riding my bike, he was like fucking hitting a bag, you know, I said, this is a real deal, you know. I was like coming in in my, he was, got his truck. Um, you know, they, they, there was an incident that happened on the abyss where, you know, he, he was almost hurt. And I think that he was upset about his own feelings of, of being frightened and angry. And he expressed that to Rolling Stone. And Rolling Stone wrote an article. It was kind of a negative article about Jim. Mm. I was on that set the, the entire time. I had a great time. I didn't like being in Gaffney, South Carolina for five months. <laughs> a lot of times not working, but I don't, you know, I, I think that, I think people look for, um, and there, you know, like I said, there are some people out there that can be really rough, you know, 
And um, I just, uh, and maybe a as people become more and more successful, they can get rougher and rougher. I, I certainly have never seen it. Uh, I certainly never saw it with Jim. But, um, you know, I, like I said, why isn't he allowed to, like, when he's doing a $150 million movie, to, you know, blow a stack every once in a while, you know? When, what's the difference between him and, you know, one of these guys, you know, we're going to watch, what is today? When tomorrow night there'll be some, some coach, I got him! What about, you know, screaming at one of his players or one of the other players or the referees or whatever, you know? Yeah. So There's a lot it is what line. it is. Yeah. 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 We got another question right here. Okay, yeah. okay so my question is, of course, I wanted to ask you because uh, you recently did the audio drama of the Scrapped Alien 3 project. And I know for a while there was the rumored Neil Blomkamp project that was in development, I think, for a couple years or something like that. But I was wondering, like, you know, if by any chance, like, uh, did you have, like, you know, did you read any of the earlier script pitches or anything like that that was going to be for the audio drama? And besides that, I was wondering if you knew anything about Neil's project. Well, you know what happened with Alien 3, which yeah, was, uh, uh, you know, Newt and I lived and uh, Fox uh, made the decision, and um, David Fincher um, made the decision to, you know, like, kill us off, which doesn't really make any sense, didn't make any sense to me then. Um, I was uh, upset about it, I was angry, uh, I was hurt, um, but looking back at it, I'm kind of glad I wasn't in it. You know, um, and David Fincher, of course, he <laughs> was stupid, how stupid, because I, I, I am a, vol I used to be a volatile guy, and uh, David Fincher called, well, it's a whole backstory, but I did, ha about them trying to use a likeness of me in that movie, and it's all online, it's, you can find the stuff, but and David Fincher called me up because I wouldn't let them use a likeness of me with Hicks, with his guts, coming out and stuff like that, and, and I just said and it's, that Fox was trying to get me to okay that, and I was like, Fuck, first of all, you don't put me in your effing movie, now you want Hicks to go out like that? No, fuck you, absolutely, no. So Fincher called me up, and I read him the fucking riot act. I didn't know he was going to end up being David Fincher, but... <laughs> A little mistake there I made, but um, um, so that's, you know, I was, yeah, I was hurt, I was angry, I was upset. I think a lot of people that saw the third one uh, were, were, you know, were, were disappointed. And all of them, they, you don't follow Jim Cameron, you can't follow a Jim Cameron movie, I first of all. But that, that was a disappointment. Um, the, 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 the audio, well... Um, Neil Bloomkamp came about five years ago. Sigourney did um, a movie with him uh, called Chappie, I believe. It was yes. Chappie they worked on together. And he pitched Sigourney an idea and just, uh, about doing aliens, keeping it in space, not on Earth, in space, is which what's, from what I understand, um, Sigourney always wanted was to keep the story in space. And she, he pitched her an idea, and she really liked it. And she told him and Fox and Jim and everybody, this is what she wanted to do. Uh, from what this is the way that I understand it, I I just got a call from Neil, and the idea was he was going to act like this third aliens. I mean the third, yeah, the third aliens, the fourth one, the fifth one. How many they had made up to that point were just wiped off the map. That's and like we're Halloween. Excuse me? That's kind of like what the 2018 Halloween did, ignoring the sequels. And yeah, a sequel to the second one. A sequel to Jim's, correct. And hell, I, was, I was all on board on that one. Absolutely, Neil. I like the way that you think. Loving, your, loving, loving you. And uh, so I thought I was going to have a chance to work with Sigourney again on some really good material. Jim had read the script. Everything seemed to be moving in that direction, and then it wasn't. Uh, it might have been because Ridley Scott decided to do um, The Covenant. Um, and The Covenant, I think, was the last Aliens movie. And um, I don't think there'll ever be any more Aliens movie. There won't be any more Terminator movies. There won't be any more Star Wars movies. Everything's going streaming. And the guy um, 
who's doing Aliens Now, is the, the guy who, who no, did the... Holly. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So it's all kind of moving in that direction anyway, and he is bringing it back to Earth, from what I understand. And that was something that was kind of a deal breaker, I believe, for Sigourney. I don't want to speak for her, I, but that was a disappointment. But, there, you know, there have been a lot of disappointments in my life and in my career, and... and uh, um, it, and a lot of things that don't make sense. You know, you're cutting. See, what he had the opportunity to do, and what they, what Fincher had the opportunity to do, and he was a young filmmaker. He's a guy who just done commercials at that point. And like Jim said, Fox is pushing him all over. Do this, do that, do this, do that. And so, you know, when you're young, you know, you're just uh, trying to survive. Um, but I, you know, I. I It was just, a, it was, it, that's what they should have done years ago, and that's what uh, Neil wanted to do, and it would have been fun and interesting, and who knows, it might have been a really, really, really good movie. Maybe not. I don't, I, you know, you never really know for sure. And then um, three, four, three, four years ago also, I was approached about reading, um, doing some voiceovers for the, a script that they maybe were gonna do for Aliens 3. Uh, I think maybe Sigourney might have been saying, eh, two million's not quite enough, I want four, you know. In the meantime, something else got written and uh, uh, myself and Lance Hendrickson read that. We did a, like an audio um, presentation of that material. Uh, I read that and again, I, you know, was, si si was, you was know, that from the William Gibson yeah, script? Exactly, yeah, exactly. William okay. Gibson. I was trying to think of his name. And I don't know William Gibson, but yeah, I was, you know, I just remember that I, I was, and of course, it was just a paycheck for me at that point. So I'm, I'm not going to be, well, I don't think Hicks would, I don't, you yeah, know, let's talk about, you know, I'm just like, okay. But they, I remember Hicks like cussing, ah, motherfucking cocksucker, you bitch, goddamn motherfucker. And I, I just remember thinking, that's, that's not Hicks. You know, Hicks isn't going to be like swearing like that. But the opportunity that Neil brought to the table, which they could have done and David could have done, is brought me, Sigourney back, first of all, most importantly, brought me back, but then brought Newt back as like this 25, 26-year-old young heroine they would have gotten the hottest actress, the most successful actress at that time to play that role. And that, that might have had a, a, a really good uh, uh, vibe to it. And, uh, but uh, those were the days, my friend. I guess I'm not. <laughs> <laughs> if I could sing, you'd know what I was doing, but I can, so. All right, we got another question here. Yeah. Hey, let's see if this works a little bit better. Uh, as a child of the 80s who was raised on Michael Bean movies, first, thank you for being here. That goes without saying. And one of the good things about DVD and Blu-ray and, you know, different types of movies, the, they're like a director's cut of Terminator 2. There is a jaw-dropping scene where you are in it in a dream sequence. I think it is a great scene of the movie, and I wish it was in the regular cut. But um, yeah, I was just wondering what it was like to kind of reprise that role a little bit, even though it wasn't in the final cut, it's in the director's cut. It was seven years later, and dude, you're genetically blessed. You have not aged, you know, so I, <laughs> thank you for that. And I'll, I'll wrap up by saying you mentioned different platforms and stuff, YouTube. Uh, my name is Tom. I have a YouTube channel called Tom Finds Treasure. Check it out, and again, thank you for coming. Yeah, okay. Um, I missed the plug, but maybe you guys heard it, maybe. <laughs> yeah, just but, read the shirt. Uh, okay. Uh, come on up and, like, just show it to the camera. <laughs> um, what, was this, what was the question? It was, about reprising, it was about reprising your role as Kyle in uh, oh, yeah, Terminator yeah, yeah, yeah. 2. T2. Well, you know, Jim has a tendency to write big old scripts, big, round, lengthy, long scripts. And, uh, and then he has to... Uh, make a movie that's not three and three hours long, and that uh, scene that I shot, I think Jim fully intended to be in the movie. 
Um, it was an easy scene to shoot. Uh, I went out and s s him and he and um, Linda were together at the time. We sat out, we talked about it, and I read it. Again, it's Jim Cameron, you don't like change, you don't want to change much there. Um, we talked about what we were gonna do. We shot it the next day, it was one day shot, one day of shooting, they paid me very well. Like I said, that was a $120 million movie or, or whatever. Uh, but it was an easy scene to shoot because it was just kind of rehashing what, what Linda and I had already done. It was basically playing the same character kind of over again, almost playing the same beats. Uh, and um, that was in the movie for a long, long time. Uh, the ads came out for, trailers came out in the movie theaters, um, and that scene was in the trailers at the movie theaters. And uh, Jim called me up and he said, Michael, you know, they, they want me to make it shorter. And I've already got a couple of flashback scenes and this is gonna go, I'll put it in the director's cut. And I was, you know, like, um, that's the way, you know, we all, in life, we have, you know, good things that happen to us, things that are not good and things that are, you know, they're in, it was kind of more like, okay, you know, I, I'm not sure what was going on in my life at that time, but it certainly didn't, uh, you know, I was like, well, the goddamn star of the first one. So I don't, you know, <laughs> you know so I, I, um, uh, uh, you know, I look at that as, uh, and, and it's obvious that Jim wanted to shoot. He, he wouldn't have wasted the money if he didn't want it in the movie. But um, it prob we probably, uh, uh, well, you know, I mean, you, you, you know, I think also, there is a time frame in which movie theaters can show movies, and if they show The Terminator and it's three hours long instead of two hours and 15 minutes, they can only show it a certain amount of times per day as compared to, so certain things got cut out. Sigourney lost a huge chunk of the backstory of her and her daughter uh, that set up the relationship that she has with Newt and that's Aliens. What, yeah, that's and, why we showed the director's cut tonight. Oh, you did? We, I made sure we did. Because oh, okay. I, love, I love the story that that did. It really added a lot to... I was with Sigourney when, when, when Jim told her. <laughs> and uh, I think that she was uh, uh, surprised, to, to say the least, and uh, upset and... Uh, uh, couldn't quite wrap her head around it. <clears throat> I think a few months later when she got nominated for an Academy Award, she probably forgave him for it. But um, uh, anyway, um, that's that, uh, that, the most memorable thing about that uh, was that was the day that uh, we uh, rolled in to um, Afghanistan, Bush, Bush, the first Bush, yeah. the first day, didn't, didn't learn our lesson in Vietnam, so we thought we'd head off to <laughs> 20 years there. Um, I won't we'll get into that. That's okay. okay. We're going to take one more question right here. We'll take you two, dude. A few, yeah, oh, go ahead. So, uh, how's it going? My name is Liam O'Brien. I'm a local film producer, and you've been in the industry a long time, and I'm sure you've worked on some really great sets and some really bad sets. So, I wanted to know if you have any advice on bringing out the best in people on a set, making it fun and fulfilling for the crew, and second part to the question, any good movies you've seen recently, anything that really stood out to you? Um, again, I, I have a hard time hearing. I think that you kind of wanted some advice from like an independent film productions yeah standpoint. he wanted to know about you know making it fun getting a lot out of your crew on the set um i won't go there i won't go there um here's the thing that i <laughs> i should but i'm not I, you know i won't um there's pit, 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 never mind um <laughs> here's the thing that i tell young people about making uh, movies now. It's not about, you know, people used to, you know, they talk about films. There's no film anymore. Nobody shoots on film anymore. So there's no film anymore. And now it's just about content. And it's just about, like, content. 
And I think you have to wrap your head around the fact that nothing is going to like become like sh huge anymore. I, I, you know, and and you know, you look old enough to to you know to be sort of set in your ways and want to make movies, but you know, it seems to me right now it doesn't make any difference if it's 15 seconds or if it's, uh, two, you know, uh, 90 minutes, you know, you get something up on TikTok. If you're a young person, you get it up there and you let people see it. There's a, a short that I saw about two weeks ago, me on YouTube doing my research. Um, and there's a, a short movie called, um, I think it's called Two Men Who Meet Each Other Five Times. Is anybody familiar with that short? Two people, two people who meet each other five times, I think is the name of it. 10 minutes long, it's the most moved I've been from a film in years, really. Just extraordinarily well done short movie, 10 minutes long. Nobody, none of you know it, so I don't know, don't listen to me maybe, but there's so much, there's so many platforms, there's so much, so many television shows, there's so much stuff out there. I don't know how you ever break through. You got to just do it because you love doing it. You got to do it knowing there's probably not going to be any back end. There's probably not going to be that Academy Award. There's probably not going to be, I mean, we're not, you know, I used to have, not, not Academy Awards, but, you know, there used to be hope. <laughs> You know, when I was younger, that like people, there's so much stuff out there. Maybe just because I'm old now and I don't get it anymore, but every, almost every day I'll see that a series has been picked up for its fourth season on some platform that I've never fucking heard of before. <laughs> you know? So, my advice is that you have to love what you're doing. And you have to love the experience of doing it. And that it's kind of philosophical, but in life, I agree the same way. It's about the journey. It's not about, you never get there. And even if you get there, my agent used to handle Mel Gibson. He used to say to me, yeah, Mel Gibson's on top. Now he's fucking worried about staying there. You know, I mean, even when you get there. So... It's not, it's about the journey. It's about the creative uh, passion that you have for what you do. And I wouldn't let anybody persuade you or, you know, like, well, you can't do this or you can't, you know. If Arnold can be, do, from when I met him, end up marrying a Kennedy, <laughs> you can make the movies that you want to make, you know. Um, so, I don't know. I don't know if I really answered your question, but okay. All right, last one. Thank here. you. Yep, last question. Thanks for staying. Um, I was just wondering, you said Val Kilmer on Tombstone really pushed you. You wanted to, like, go to what he was going to. What specifically did he do differently than other actors that made you want to step up to that, and what would you have to do to match that? Well, as I said before, uh, he had a great role to start with. And, um, I, you know, I was at the, the read-through. We did a, a read-through with all the actors that were in the movie and actresses that were in the movie, and we all read through the script together. And we got to the part where we were doing Latin, speaking Latin. And I had reached out. We didn't have, like, one of these, you know. I don't have I still don't have mine. <laughs> I didn't have something I'd just pull up and say, uh, uh, um, in wine, there's truth. I, I I didn't know what any of the Latin meant, and I didn't know how to say it, you know. So we, we got we got to that part in the read through, and that's when Kevin was still directing it, and he knew it. He had it down. He knew what that Latin was. He knew how to say it. He knew it. And I was embarrassed that I was in a scene with somebody else, and they'd already they'd outworked me. They'd already done research that I should have like had, had already done. So that sort of spurred me on, and um, Val, uh, was, I, 
you know, he, he's a very smart guy. Very, very smart. Almost too smart. Some guys, sometimes these guys are so smart that it, it can backfire. A smart, really smart guy. Um, Val was always Doc Holliday. People ask me, like, what's Val Kilmer like? I'm like, I don't know. I never met Val Kilmer. Never met him. I, st I haven't to this day. I don't know Val Kilmer from you. And I'm serious about that. I don't know. Not, I mean... I know Joanne, I know, his, you know, I know about him. I know people that have worked with him. I know stories about him, but I don't know him personally. And I was, you know, I was a little bit Johnny Ringo. So I had nothing to say to him. I had nothing. We had nothing in common. We had, and it was a little bit the same with Kurt. Kurt, although Kurt kind of had to take over certain things, and I went in and spoke with him, but Val was always in character, always in character. Not in that, like, uh, you have to call me by my character's name. You gotta call me Doc Holliday when I'm, not like that. Just, he always had that accent. One of the things that he did, which is, um, and I'm gonna forget the name of it, but there's certain things that, and I believe me, I've had a lot of it done to me before because I've played a lot of sweaty characters, which is um, oh, glycerin. All right, there's a couple of different ways that you can create um, a sweaty look on, on, on film. And one of the ways is with glycerin. Another way is just have, right before a shot, have a wardrobe person, I mean, a makeup person come up and spray you. And you've got this, like, kind of look on your face. And, and, but glycerin, I find to be really irritating in a way that is, like, horrifically irritating. So I, I put that on, and after two or three minutes, I'm like, ah, fuck, this is horrible. I can't, I can't use this. And I think that Val had the same... Um, I, think, I think it was painful for Val to wear glycerin, too. I think he, he had the same reaction to glycerin that I had. Like, I won't, won't use this stuff, man. It's horrible. But he did, and he was always bitching about it. Always bitching about it, but in kind of a Doc Holiday kind of way, like he might be bitching about his cough or might be, you know, like a dying man would be bitching about the fact that he's dying. And he was always bitching about this stuff, and I, I knew that I couldn't wear it. And I think that he used that to create a pain that, of what a dying man might be going through, just an, an omnipresent, like, irritant, like, Th thing that you just couldn't get rid of. And he was always had that, that southern kind of accent going on and flip. And like Doc Holliday, he always has kind of the cool lines, the smart things to say. And um, there are some people that feel like it's difficult to work with somebody like Val. I, I've never, I don't really find anybody, but he, I thought he was not only, this is the best thing about Tombstone. I mean, without Val, without Val, without Val and, and, and me, but you take our movie, you take our scenes out of that movie, yeah, fucking movie, so it is what it is, but it's, it's Val's movie. And I just happen to be along for the ride, and I just happen to jump on his horse, or jump on a horse next to him and say, let me see if I can keep up with you, which I thought I did a pretty good job of. So, um, he's a remarkable guy. Yeah. Thank you. You're welcome. All right. I think right. you did more than a pretty good job on that film, by the way. Oh, but thank you. That's just my opinion. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. All right. Well, thank well, you for all three of you that have uh, decided to stay. <laughs> no, I'm joking. Which camera do I look at? There's thousands of people out there. They're still here. Um, thank you for, for coming by, seeing the movie. Thanks for hanging in and listening um, to stuff that you could probably find on YouTube anyway. Um, you had some uh, great questions. Um, is there anybody you. else I can... Uh, oh, look at that pretty girl back there. Who's that walking in the background? I better get home. I better get home. <laughs> That's okay. <laughs> Thank you so much for okay. being with us tonight. Thank you.